I think we've just come out of some uh, legislation that's been very hard, and we have passed this. We now, I think that we would certainly be interested in the thing that uh, Governor Fonk Jane's uh, elect that uh, he mentioned here last night, and trying to extend markets and expand markets for farmers, because farmers are in, in a real need to improve their position. Uh, when they're sitting at some 65 percent of parity, I don't think they would be satisfied with this level. And so right now, until we get uh, time to get with our legislative program, of course, we'll take the resolutions that have been adopted here today, and we'll sit down and make some priorities as to which ones we will get actively involved with. We've got national policy that we'll be trying to execute and state policy. Until I've had an opportunity to sit down with the staff and with the leadership of this organization, and we, uh, uh, to give exactly what the priority would be at this point, I, I would be at a loss to say. But we'll go through the resolution policy booklet, and we allow the leadership and the staff, as I said, to develop the priorities, and we will be responsive to farmers' wishes. Last night, the Montgomery Housing Authority declared the contract for the demolition of the Jackson Heights housing project in default. This followed a request by the contractor, Isaac Bracey, for a 20-day extension on that job. Earlier, Bracey had asked for and received a change order from the Housing Authority, which gave him an additional $5,200 for the project due to some unknown demolition problems. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has said that it will not agree to that extra money. One member of the Housing Authority, John Knight, said the affair is now in the hands of the Department of HUD. I think basically that as HUD's time now to do something. We've made our decision. Uh, we approve the change order in good faith, and I'm very vehemently opposed to the way that HUD has reacted to this particular project as it relates to the change order. I think the change order was justified, and the entire board uh, thought that the change order was justified, and HUD decided to turn it down. So now I don't know what the status of the project will be. Have you heard from the contractor or the bonding company at all on the matter? No, I certainly haven't. I don't know exactly what will be the status of the project from this point on. But uh, it's a little indecision, in my opinion, on behalf of HUD. We made our decision uh, to grant the change order. HUD, subsequent to that, came in and said that they would not approve our change order to the contractor. And uh, that is what is causing some of the problems that we're having at this point. The city of Montgomery had problems in the first place getting permission from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to tear this housing project down. Now it looks as if they're still having problems in getting the demolition completed. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. Well, we provided the, the same thing last year, only we had a booth outside of the Capitol Plaza Annex. This, this time, we've located it inside where it will be much more comfortable, comfortable for our customers to come in and uh, uh, mail packages and buy stamps and uh, also uh, purchase uh, limited philatelic products. Are, is there any particular area that you're trying to serve in the city? Yes, there are a lot of people that live south of the Boulevard, and uh, of course uh, there's a lot of shopping that takes place in the Montgomery Mall and also the Capitol Plaza Mall, uh, and this provides them an easy, convenient uh, station where they can uh, do their postal business. Now, how long will this be open? Uh, we plan to keep it open until the 22nd, Friday the 22nd of December. And what will the hours be? It will be from 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. It was another tough loss for Huntington tonight in the consolation game in the Montgomery Tip-Off Club Tournament. The Hawks lost to Tuskegee 87-81 to after leading most of the game. The Golden Tigers fought back late in the game and tied the score at 77 with about four minutes left. The team swapped a couple of baskets, and then Tuskegee went ahead for good 83-81 to on this basket by George Robinson with less than one minute to play. A few seconds later, Tuskegee stole the ball back and four free throws by Alan Watson iced the win for Tuskegee. Huntington coach Neil Posey said after the game, his team just ran out of gas. We tried a new lineup tonight, and the kids played real well. They 
ran out of gas. They got a little tired near the end, and when you put some of the first men back in, they were not loose and didn't play very well, but I give Tuskegee a lot of credit. Tuskegee had a good ball club, and so did Jacksonville. It's early in the year, and we're still experimenting with a lot of young men, and I think uh, before the season's over, we'll make a good account of ourselves. We're very disappointed in these two ball games. Been ahead at the half of both of them and a pretty comfortable lead at times and let it slip away, but most of it was my fault tonight. Uh, the kid just got awfully tired, and we in exams. That's been alibi, and I don't mean to take a thing away from Tuskegee, but uh, we're in exams, and some of the kids have been staying up studying, and with four ball games in five days, it's an awful lot of ball games. James Spann, WSFA TV Sports. The Municipal Electrical Utility Association is composed of 12 small cities throughout Alabama. To become a member, a city must be capable of distributing electricity to its citizens. Currently, 15 cities in Alabama have that capability. During today's meeting, the association voted to keep its existing offices. Guy Thompson, the mayor of Opelika, was re-elected chairman. After the election of offices, the association focused its attention on proposed legislation. The association currently abides electricity from Alabama Power Company, but during the next legislative session, a bill will be introduced that hopefully will enable the association to begin generating its own power. Chairman Guy Thompson says it looks as if the bill has a good chance of passing. Well, how are your rates be as compared to Alabama Power Company? Have you all figured that out yet? <clears throat> well, <coughs> Excuse me. We, we certainly uh, would hope, well, in fact, if we didn't think it would be cheaper, we would not be trying to do this. This, this is, we feel like that this is what it would enable us to, to better serve uh, our customers with cheaper electricity. Uh, how do you feel the outcome of your efforts will be? Oh, I think we're going to get it. Sure, I do. <laughs> we, we failed last year, but we, we're going to be in there pitching this year. I think we'll get it. The Utility Association wants the capabilities of producing its own power. Although Alabama Power Company would like to keep them as a customer, they have indicated that they will work with the organization to ensure an acceptable solution. Janet May, WSFA TV News. Uh, in that same process, as mayor of the city of Tuskegee, I sent letters to the FBI, the U.S. Attorney and other federal officials indicating that the city of Tuskegee would be happy to, in, to cooperate with any investigation that's on the way, uh, they intended to get on the way. Our philosophy about this whole matter is that investigations are good. Uh, I think that you ought not to be in public life if you can't stand investigations. So we are cooperating with them. We're waiting to let, for them to let us know what it is they would like for us to do. In the meantime, I'd like to talk more about what it is the city of Tuskegee has tried to do as a result of the results of the state audit. We felt that we were glad that we had an audit because it pointed out certain weaknesses we had in our administrative capability in terms of financial management. Since that time, we've looked at all of our financial reports, our annual audits, we've looked at the state audit, we've looked at our response to the audit. I've convened our financial staff and our auditors, and we've come up with specific plans of actions which we plan to take to strengthen our financial capability in terms of complying with the bid law, in terms of dealing with our accounts payable and receivables, in terms of we've ordered a new computer system which will put our city on computerization, a city dealing with the amounts of money that Tuskegee has should be computerized. We've hired a new purchasing agent and a property manager in terms of being able to keep account of our inventory and our assets. So we have, in the city of Tuskegee, taken the state audit very serious. It pointed out some weaknesses we have, and we've tried to do something about it. 
This afternoon, members participated in a series of workshops on parliamentary procedure, constitutional amendments, and legislative resolutions. The purpose of today's workshops is to acquaint members with the various resolutions that will be considered by the General Assembly in the next two days. One proposed resolution deals with proration, another with the position of education in a possible revised state constitution. AEA President Tyna Davis says a perennial consideration deals with diversion of funds from the Special Education Trust Fund. Alabama is unique in terms of the way uh, education is funded with our Special Educational Trust Fund. Uh, we hold firmly as an organization uh, that there should be no diversion of monies, and that is always a standing uh, resolution for us. And there are others that would deal with uh, class size, you know, until we get class size, until we get teacher salaries, until we get those standards that we feel are, are just essential for an ongoing educational program, they will remain as continuing resolutions for the organization. The session formally opens tonight with reports by Mrs. Davis and AEA Executive Secretary Paul Hubbard. Glenda Webb, WSFA TV News at Montgomery Civic Center. Landmark subdivision residents have complained not only about the noise and smell of the roosting blackbirds, but also of the fear of contracting histoplasmosis, a disease associated with a highly fertilized ground below where the birds perch. The County Health Department has received recommendations from the Fish and Wildlife Department representatives on ideas that might rid the residential area of the bird problem. Mr. F. W. Aldridge of the Health Department says which of these methods to be used is up to the owner of the property. Uh, the first would be to clear the vegetation from the property. Another alternative would be to do a combination of thinning and pruning to eliminate at least 50 percent of the perch area. And the third alternative is uh, the approach of noise harassment. What must be done now is contacting the landowner, which the health department is in the process of doing. What the nearby residents complain of will cost a lot of money to correct, and all of it is left up to the landowner, and there are no binding responsibilities other than neighborly ones. At the Landmark Subdivision, Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. The top women's college volleyball teams from around the country are in Tuscaloosa for the national tournament going on today through Saturday. The 24 teams in the tournament reach the competition either through regional qualifying performances or at-large selection. Four teams from the south are in the tournament, Kentucky, Florida State, Ole Miss, and the host team, Alabama, who lost their opener this morning to Hawaii. The first game, I think we're, we were still a little asleep, but second game, we came back and played a good, uh, solid game. We lost 15 to 11, which I, I think gives an indication that we can play with the good teams, and I hope it's an indication of how the momentum um, is going to go for our next matches. All right, so this marks the end of the year then for Alabama after yes, the tournament. Yes, this is, this is it. Okay, a, a lot of teams are here, 25 of them. What, what, where do they come from? All over the country? Uh, who, who are some of the better teams in the tournament? Well, uh, the West Coast teams seem to be the dominant teams. Um, Hawaii, Pepperdine, UC UCLA, USC, Utah State. Mo most of the Western teams, um, some of the Northern teams, uh, Pittsburgh, Purdue, some of those teams are, are highly ranked also. The top seed in the tournament is two-time national champion UCLA. The Bruins have a 24-4 and record on the year. Hawaii is seeded number two, while the number three seed is Brigham Young. The new national volleyball women's champion will be decided in the title match Saturday night at 8 o'clock. From Tuscaloosa, I'm James Spann, WSFA TV Sports. Chuck Stevens says he plans to sell about 1,000 trees here at his farm in southwestern Atauga County. That's about a 400% increase over last year. There are several reasons attributed to this increased demand. First, inflation has hit the business hard, driving up the prices of pre-cut trees from the north by as much as 25%. And secondly, more and more people are shunning their artificial trees for the real ones. So it's only natural that the increased demand is causing a shortage of the trees, at least in the north. Well, according to the National Christmas Tree Growers Association, there will be a shortage nationwide this year. Uh, approximately two to three million trees, according to the survey that they have made. It's going to be spotty, 
Uh, there'll be some areas that the trees will be probably short, and some areas they will have plenty. So what would you attribute this to? Uh, <clears throat> the bad weather in the north the last several years has reduced the planting, plus the fact that everybody's going back to the good old natural tree like they were brought up with. And the people in the north that started the Christmas tree industry, oh, some 30-some-odd some some years ago have gotten older, and so many of the children are not coming back into the business, and that is creating a shortage from the trees being shipped from the north. Does that help your business in the south? We feel like it certainly will help our business in the south, plus the fact that the high transportation costs of shipping trees from Michigan, Minnesota, and the north into the south is going to put us an advantage locally. Stevens says he has received inquiries for trees from as far away as California, but he says he would rather supply trees to the public in Alabama simply to promote the Christmas tree business here in the state. Dave Rickey, WSFA TV News, Atauga County. The cost of operating a motel or hotel, like other businesses, continues to rise. Not only do the innkeepers have to combat higher costs for wages, materials, utilities, and furnishings, they also have a problem with theft. Many people think of motel and hotel thievery as simply taking a towel home, but it goes way beyond that. In fact, you might be surprised at some of the items people steal. One local motel operator, Jim Wolven, says all this stealing serves only to increase the cost of a motel room. He says in addition to the regular fare of towels and linens, thieves have been known to remove the entire contents of rooms. But he says the smaller items are still more popular. Uh, since March of 75, we've replaced uh, 4,320 bath towels, 6,240 hand towels, and 6,000 face cloths, among the other items. Bath mats, soap, uh, dispensers, and Kleenex, these things they take by the box, lift out the cover and take a whole box, take a bed spread. I suppose uh, probably the largest item in a motel or hotel room would be the television. What are your problems with uh, the thefts of televisions? Well, years and a few years ago, we had a tremendous problem. We had lost uh, 28 by May of 77. And uh, we have just lost one in the last few weeks. However, we have taken preventive measures, which have cut down on our losses. What, uh, what sort of way are you combating this? Uh, we have a uh, louver over our doors with a screen behind it. And this was their method of entry into the room in order to lift the television after discerning that there was no one in the room. And uh, so what we have done, we have placed a steel plate in the aperture between the screen and the louvers, which prevents their entering the rooms now. The manager of this motel says the theft rate remains about the same as it has been the past few years, with the exception of television sets. He says not as many of those are being taken now because of the measures they've taken to prevent that. All in all, these thefts cause the price of motel rooms to the consumer to go up and up. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. I will see that city services are done on a fair and equal basis to all citizens in all areas of the district. I will show no favoritism. The first thing you think of when you make a decision... ...new businesses. We need to move forward now in Montgomery. We need to plan for greatness. This does not involve in, uh, involve in any way sell out or sacrifice. We simply need to plan. Come on, Bordeaux, you gotta hit something
Of December right, in 1950, a prayer for each of our servicemen. And in order to encourage 28 years ago, that this will be the last time that I will be with you on the lighting of the Christmas tree as the governor of your state. But I've enjoyed being with you in the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even though I cannot speak for the next governor, I do know that Governor James, in my judgment, will join with you in this celebration next year. As we think about the many blessings that our Lord has bestowed upon us and his individuals, and the blessings uh, bestowed upon the people of Alabama, he's been very good to us during the last year. And it's very fitting that we come here at this moment to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, His only Son, Jesus Christ. And we must realize and recognize that the Christmas season, that's what it's all about. Because He said that we can lay all of our sins upon His shoulders, and He, of course, calls upon us for repentance. And I believe at this Christmas time of the year, we should think very thoroughly about the message brought in the New Testament think about the message of peace on earth, goodwill to men, and our prayers are to God that we will have someday genuine peace throughout the entire world. Remember those far off days when a fighting little judge took on the movers and the shakers of a great statewide political power, struck single-handed. House Speaker Joe McCorkadale says rewriting the state's 1901 Constitution is going to be a job. Governor-elect Bob James has committed himself to the document, but McCorkadale says it will be done slowly enough that everyone will have a chance to know what's being put in it. The state's Constitution will affect everyone from the local level on up, and all have strong interests in it. One group with possible interest in it as well is the federal government, and McCorkadale says that possibility worries him. You know, we are under review on practically everything we do. And that dealing with uh, election law changes, of course, uh, we're, we're under constant review on that, must have approval. And, of course, this will be dealt with because the election law changes will be built into a constitution, a new constitution. And uh, I feel that uh, we'll have uh, a very, very tight scrutiny and we'll re have review from federal agencies on anything we adopt. Tied in with all of this is the federal government's Voting Rights Act of 1965, which McCorkadale says was manipulated into place as another means of constant review of the state's legislative action. 
these people that serve in the Alabama legislature are, are elected by the, the citizens of this state. And it was for a long period of time that our action, along with the Supreme Court of Alabama, was final action. And now, of course, it's, it's developed where this is just the point of beginning. And I know I have resented it, and I think many others have, and I think the vast majority of citizens in this state resent it. And this could be one of the pitfalls of getting into uh, a total uh, new document as far as the Constitution, because we have no idea how much intervention or how much supervision we'll have. McCorkadale says recommendations that the Constitution be revised article by article might not be a bad idea, giving them time to see if the federal authorities plan to jump in with their plans and regulations. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. Tom Jones is a 49-year-old salesman. The lifelong resident of Montgomery believes he's overtaxed, underprotected, and overburdened with welfare programs. If we as individuals can cut back, trim the fat, skimp, and take care of priorities, I see no reason why it can't be done in local city government. The thought of a tax increase has never entered my mind. Martha Nachman says a revision of the garbage and trash routes will save the city approximately $100,000 a year. Mrs. Nachman has worked as a community and civic leader for the past 14 years. She believes the city must begin generating new revenue to attract new businesses. We need to move forward now in Montgomery. We need to plan for greatness. This does not involve, it, uh, involve in any way sell out or sacrifice. We simply need to plan. We need to adhere to the projected recommendations of the Planning Commission. These recommendations alone will provide our assurance of no spot zoning. They will provide assurance that each of us is protected. City beautification programs are one of the interests of Elise Reynolds. Mrs. Reynolds has lived in Montgomery for the past 16 years. She believes her active involvement in community affairs has kept her in touch with the district. I will see that city services are done on a fair and equal basis to all citizens in all areas of the district. I will show no favoritism. The first thing you think of when you make a decision is how it will affect your family. And the first thing I will think of when I make a decision on the city council is how it will affect your family and mine. Paul Robertson has lived in District 7 for the past 25 years. Robertson says the city council should work within the city budget. However, he believes a salary increase for firemen and law enforcement officers is in order. I will support the mayor in his upgrading of the salaries for our firefighters and law enforcement officers. For you people that don't know, in the last year, the uh, law enforcement officers and firefighters have received almost a $1,000 raise. If the gentleman back here can back me up. If I make a mistake, would you please correct me? He instituted a hazard duty pay mm -hmm. that last year was a $300 hazard duty pay to both of these men. And to be increased $300 this year and $300 next year, which puts the firefighters and the, the uh, law enforcement officers in a $10,000 a year category, which I still don't think is high enough. And According to John Slayton, insufficient drainage has long plagued District 7. Slayton says he can't understand why something hasn't been done about it. He believes the city is creating new problems faster than it's solving the old ones, and that's one of the reasons for the lag in population growth. The city is obviously expanding outward, just like so many others. Most cities are experiencing population pressures that force them ever outward. But what about Montgomery? Since the bypass construction started in Montgomery, we have experienced an annual population increase of 1.1%. More recently, We've seen a greater annual increase in population since the 1970 census, 
we've experienced an annual rate of increase of slightly less than 3%. Healthy, but not booming. The election will be held on Tuesday, December 12th. Janet May, WSFA TV News. One. Bill's an Exxon geologist, and he's looking for the fuel that may someday provide energy for your home. It's a resource that's getting harder and harder to find, and the search will take all of Bill's experience and a good deal of technology. But it isn't oil Bill's looking for, it's uranium. Most of America's surface uranium has already been found, so explorers like Bill Sims are taking the search deeper and deeper underground. Looking for uranium today is a lot like looking for oil. Even the geology is similar. We gather clues by studying rocks on the surface, by mapping and by drilling. It's a lot like solving a giant puzzle. Bill Sims is one of hundreds of Exxon geologists in oil and gas, in coal and in uranium, who search every day for tomorrow's supplies of energy for a strong America. Our guest today on Meet the Press is Senator George McGovern of South Dakota, the 1972 Democratic nominee for president. Considered the leading liberal in the Senate, he is a member of the Joint Economic, Foreign Relations, and Agriculture Committees. Senator, while health insurance, tax reform, and such things, welfare, got put aside this year, the Congress has been concentrating on such matters as gas deregulation and tax breaks focused on the middle class and on business. Doesn't this congressional session indicate that the President and the majority of Democrats in Congress are riding the conservative tide against spending and taxes. I think it indicates exactly that, uh, Mr. Monroe. Uh, I wouldn't concede that that's where the uh, mood of the country is, but I think uh, liberals in the Congress and in the administration have been sold on the idea that uh, about all we can do is tinker with the reorganization of government uh, put through some uh, reductions in taxes, some reductions in uh, federal programs, and.